testimonies of those subjected to America's prison system can be summed up in two words. It's bullshit. Those are the words of Ben, a prisoner serving near 20 years in prison. Many like to hail America as being at the top in nearly all measurable metrics in the world, and they would be right in assuming the same for the prison system. We are number one. Number one for the largest prison population, incarceration rate, number of jail, and the total cost spent on prisons. America's criminal justice system is undoubtedly broken, and its flaws are nowhere more apparent than its prison system. Fortunately, we know what to attribute those problems to. But unfortunately, the problem, prison overcrowding, has snowballed into uncontrollable proportions. Prison overcrowding, as the name implies, occurs when a prison exceeds its max capacity of prisoners. For example, in 2011 in California, the prison population was at 180% of the population intended. In fact, it got so bad that the United States Supreme Court ended up ruling that the overcrowding in California was a direct violation of the Eighth Amendment of cruel and unusual punishment. And it's by no means a California problem. A quick glance at this graph shows that 38 states have overcrowded prisons, and nine of them at 140% or more of the population intended. Mis misunderstandings and misconceptions have clouded the judgment of legislators and the populace alike. And so today, I'll be walking you through the three most misunderstood aspects of overcrowding in America. One, the cost of incarceration. Two, the causes of prison overcrowding and whether or not it's avoidable, and three, the impact that it has on public safety. And finally, after diagnosing the problem, we'll be looking for solutions for the future. So first is cost. The average cost to house one prisoner is $31,000 per year, according to the Merit Institute of Justice. And the total cost rounds up to about $39 billion per year from taxpayers. And in this graph, we see that an increase in the prison population is correlated with an increase in spending. If you see the small dip here, it was representative of the minuscule decrease in prisoners in 2010. But it's not just an increase in spending. Cutting costs in prisons could help us spend more in other sectors as well, such as education. In fact, here we see the comparison of the budgets of prisons and education. And prison budgets are growing nearly 80% faster. So the meaning of justice becomes hazy once you realize that it costs more to go to prison than to a university. Second are causes. And now people like to argue that overcrowding is naturally occurring. However, faulty legislation shows otherwise. Three strikes and you're out. But this time you're not playing baseball. And the consequences in maybe losing a game, it's life in prison. This famous law made it that anyone who committed two felonies previously would be sentenced 25 to life if they committed another felony, or in California if they committed any crime at all. And legislation such as this received huge support in the top on crime 80s and 90s. In fact, you can see a huge upward leap in the prison population starting from the 1980s. <coughs> and here's where things become a little confusing. Now, it may seem just to lock up violent and dangerous criminals, but the problem is, most of these criminals aren't violent in the first place. According to the California Department of Corrections Rehabilitation, 56% of three-strike inmates were convicted on non-violent offenses. And so, not only are they getting unproportional sentences, but the problem is that these people are actually being subjected to cruel and unusual punishment as stated before. And so, here we can see that it affects the racism, it causes the racism in the legal system as well. So the one on the left represents mass incarceration in general, while the one on the right is on the three strikes law. And they both adequately represent the racial disparities in prison. <coughs> now you can see that African Americans and Hispanics are far more likely to be in prison, and minorities are heavily targeting the enforcement of the three strikes law. In fact, according to a report by the Justice Policy Institute in 2004, African Americans were 10 times more likely to be imprisoned than whites, and Hispanics were 80% more likely to be imprisoned. In addition to that, a large percentage of the inmate population are the people before they've been convicted. And so here we see that that's a huge portion of people who could not put up bail. And so what this does is simply imprison people for being too poor. 
Cutting down on this specific aspect of prisons can help us combat overcrowding in the long run. So third is safety. Now, people may assume that locking up these criminals behind bars is going to improve safety, but in fact, the opposite is true, because violent prisons tend to be overcrowded ones. In fact, according to the Government Accountability Office, prison overcrowding results in increased inmate misconduct, which negatively affects the safety and security of both inmates and staff. Sexual victimization rates also go up, and this is due to a shortage of staff that are employed in times of overcrowding, which allows incidents to go unnoticed. And furthermore, according to Michael Ritterman of the Turing University, recidivism rates can also go up, which is the rate at which an offender commits crimes after they've been released. And so overcrowded prisons expose inmates to psychosocial stress and denies them rehabilitative programs, which can lead to more impulsive actions and more likely for drug use. Michael Carball, a former an inmate, concurs with this viewpoint by saying the rehabilitative programs that did work were cut due to overcrowding. So it's clear that the increasing prison population is a problem. And these are the two best solutions. One is simply not to manage bail. It's far simpler to do a pretrial risk assessment and determine whether or not certain inmates are at risk for flight. Washington, D.C. implemented this, and in the past five years, 90% of those released were not arrested again. And the overwhelming majority of those that were, were arrested on nonviolent offenses. Another solution is investing in better rehabilitative programs. What this does is it can rid the people who are convicted on nonviolent drug offenses and those that are there because of mental health issues. But it can also help violent criminals as well. In fact, according to James Gillian, a professor of uh, psychiatry, states that using a rehabilitative model of a re-intensive educational program reduced violent reoffending by 83%. Every taxpayer dollar spent on the program saved $4 in return, and $30,000 was saved per year per inmate in the program. Perhaps the greatest achievement was that violence in the prison was down to zero. So taking a step back, we can see that the prison overcrowding is extremely costly and wastes taxpayer dollars. It increases violence inside the prison and outside of it. And the legislation that fosters overcrowding should be repealed and replaced. So, and uh, while people may assume that it's uncontrollable, there's a plethora of solutions, including not demanding bail and investing better rehabilitative programs, both of which have been worked in the past. So it's time to break the shackles of our outdated thinking, because in the end, we're the ones being imprisoned by this faulty system. So let's make America number one again, but this time for the right reasons. <laughs>